On July 3, 1979, the CIA gave birth to Islamic fundamentalism, when President Carter signed a directive for United States intelligence to provide radical Islamic thinking and arms to Afghan fighters before the Soviet Union invaded. This is documented in a 1998 interview with Zbigniew Brzezinski, Carter's national security advisor. Who killed John O'Neill? John, John O'Neill. Who killed John O'Neill? I don't I eat, barely I, I don't shower, shower, I don't shave, I don't, shave, month, I don't, I don't, I don't see water, anybody, I don't talk, I can't to remember the last I don't time shower, I don't shower, I don't shave, or even left my I don't do anything but think. I know. They I know. know. They I know they, they did it. I want to prove it. I, I have to prove, to prove it. it. What? I have to prove, to prove it. No, if I should. I must. I have to. Should I? Council, Council on Foreign, Foreign Relations, Relations Trilateral, Trilateral Commission, Commission, Bilderberg Group, the CIA, Bush family, Kissinger, CIA, Brzezinski, everybody. Everybody's in everybody. on it. Why don't more people everybody know about out the puzzle. Why do they care? The Council on Foreign Relations has controlled the world for 50 figure years. You can go on their website and read about it. Am I the only person who feels the need to know more? Am I the only person who feels the need to know more? I'm afraid this obsession will be off. I'm afraid this will be off. I'm more afraid. I am more afraid. Don't become a like everyone else. I am more afraid. Of being at 9-11, I was like everyone else. Flag I was waving a flag waving like patriot. I thought Al Qaeda did it too. I thought we should bomb the Arabs straight back to the fucking Stone Age, just like everybody else. Bomb did. them straight then to hell. Then I read about, John, I read about John, John, O'Neill. John O'Neill. Maverick counterterrorism expert in the FBI. O'Neill tracked Osama bin Laden since 1995. Osama bin Laden. He knew more about Osama than anyone in the world. Tracked him past the embassy bombings in 98, <laughs> coal bombing in 2000. He knew more about Osama and Al Qaeda than anyone in the world. Isn't that interesting? And O'Neill? And O'Neill, he got into some trouble. His investigations into terrorism were blocked from up on high. Blocked by whom? In the summer of 2001, he resigned as deputy director of the FBI. At the same time, he was publicly opposed to the anti terrorism policies of President George W. Bush. September, September 10th, 2001, 2001 September 10th. he started his new job with a company called Pearl Associates as head of security at the World Trade Center. A day later, he was dead. A victim of the September 11 he terrorist died at attacks. The World Trade Center. Come on! Come on! The FBI's top counterterrorism expert, who after chasing bin Laden for six years, just happened to take a job in the private sector. He's murdered in an internationally televised terrorist attack, blamed on his arch nemesis. Killed by his arch nemesis. How ironic. Coincidence? Coincidence. Fate? Fate. Conspiracy. Conspiracy. Why did O'Neill start working at the World Trade Center? Why were his investigations into Al Qaeda stopped? Who arranged for him to get his new ill fated job? I know the answers to these questions now. None of them have anything to do with Osama bin Laden. The more you look at the whole and not just the pieces, <laughs> you don't know anything. The more you understand what really happened. John O'Neill is the key. Look into John O'Neill. Cole Associates, Brian Jenkins, Jerome Howard. Look for John O'Neill, he's the key. Michael Tricasti, you ever look into the LAPD? Want to go back to the end? Robert Mueller. John O'Neill is the U.S. Attorney's Office. 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 Go back and look at Robert Mueller, and come back and look at CIA, Cassie, Brat, the John Miller, ABC World Trade Center, Center Building Number Guess what they found out that Osama wanted to World Trade Center Building Number, number 7. You want to know where that came from? 2326. John Miller. It was John Federal Great Friend of Guess Who. Of all John Federal Agents John O'Neill. Great Friends of Guess Who. Jerome Howard. Brian Jenkins. Jerome Howard. Jerome Howard. Jerome Howard. William Bratt. Jerome Howard. Everybody having the guy who got John O'Neill his job at the World Trade Center. You'll know everything.
why. That's a very good question. So who did kill John O'Neill? To understand what happened to John O'Neill, you have to know what happened to 11 11. I am prepared to listen. Are you sure? I am sure. The CIA created Islamic fundamentalism in 1979. It was a way to draw the Soviet Union into a war with Afghanistan. It gave the Soviets their Vietnam War. It, it destroyed their economy and dispelled support of communism. It was a smart thing to do, wasn't it? Well, not without a price. See, during the war, the U.S., U.K., and Pakistan all supported groups of Arab fighters known as the Mujahideen. Two of the freedom fighters were Ramzi Youssef and Osama bin Laden. Books printed by the University of Nebraska and paid for by the U.S. Department of Education taught the Mujahideen radical theories of Islam and, and treated them to math problems and literature exercises riddled with allusions to guns, bombs, tanks, just overall general killing, you know, they... They trained them to be violent. And then they wonder why they become terrorists. It would seem that creating a radical branch of Islam pales in comparison to ending the Cold War. It would seem that way, yes. But at, after the Soviets withdrew, the, the Mujahideen were left without political support in a, in a, in a war-torn, impoverished, and socially unstable nation-state. So they started a second resistance movement, this time aimed toward the United States. 
And the primary group formed at this time, in the late 80s, was Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was an intelligence operation from its start straight up to now. That's a very dangerous thing to say. Even though it's true. See, from its inception, Al-Qaeda has been trained, funded, armed, and supported by the Pakistani intelligence agency, the ISI. The ISI, by its own disclosure, is, is an arm of the American CIA. It's a very ominous association that might have been happened on 9-11. It's not the first time it came back to bite us in the ass. Iran-Contra, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. I mean, there are plenty of others that haven't been as widely reported as that one. Iran-Contra is now a far cry from the CIA's involvement with Al-Qaeda. You're right. In Iran-Contra channel money to, to, to states already considered terrorist nations like Iran, Iraq, Libya, Lebanon. And as the other half of the handshake, trillions of dollars in illegal narcotics have made their way into this country, from the Middle East, the Far East, and Latin America. It shows a pattern of fraud and complicity by the U.S. government to promote instability abroad to further their domestic agenda. And it goes a long way to explain its governance of the ISI and Al-Qaeda. It is frightening how tightly the ISI and Al-Qaeda fit together, isn't it? It's more frightening how often the major media typically ignore it. The media seem too busy trying to scare us all into submission. Yeah. By aiding the government and covering up the truth and thereby giving credence to the bogus official story. Where is ISI in the official story? The official story of 9-11 implicates a man named Omar Sheikh Saeed as the paymaster for lead hijacker Mohammed Atta. And a man named Khalid Shaikh Mohammed as the operational mastermind behind both men are well-known ISI agents. How do I know the name Saeed? Well, probably because he's one of the most infamous terrorists known to man. You may know him by another name, too, because he has about a half dozen aliases. But his big claim to fame is his conviction for the kidnapping and murder of Wall Street Journal reporter Daniel Pearl in February of 2002. Daniel Pearl was killed by an ISI agent? By the very man the government claims assisted in the 9-11 attacks. Pearl was on his way to meet Saeed when he disappeared. Saeed, using one of his aliases, knew that Pearl was investigating ISI ties to Al-Qaeda in 9-11. I thought Pearl was killed because he was Jewish. But it's far more likely he was killed by a high-ranking ISI agent to, to make sure he didn't print in a major U.S. newspaper ISI's connections to Al-Qaeda because that, in turn, would implicate the CIA. Well, think about it. If Al-Qaeda is funded by the ISI, and the ISI is funded by the CIA, two plus two is four. What I am saying is, even though it's virtually impossible to believe the official story of 9-11, on the off chance it is true, the CIA, and therefore this government, is guilty of negligence, for continuing to function as a liaison between Pakistan and Al-Qaeda. So, no matter what happened, if it was them, if it was us, if it was anybody, the CIA is guilty anyway? It sounds like you just want the CIA to be guilty. He's on to us. He's CIA. Get off the phone. Okay, you, you, you are putting this whole thing in jeopardy, man. Okay, you, you, you were talking about an open line to someone you don't know, and you were telling him everything. Okay, so just, just, just put it in your head. Keep it in your head. Right up here. Just talk to me. Don't talk to him. Talk to me. It's all good. What are you doing here? What, what, what? <laughs> I am here to keep you from making a huge mistake, okay? Now, post that in the world, you cannot trust anybody, especially no you and I know. I understand. Okay, good. I understand that. Hey, wait, no, 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 okay, no, 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 it's okay, you understand, let's go pack a bag, get, get your stuff, and let's get out of here, we still get out of here if we do no. Nah, no, what, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> okay, 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 CIA hits ones, okay, CIA hits ones, are, they're coming up the stairs, oh, yeah. oh, there are plenty of people, whole hits, AK-47s and black vests, man, you know they're coming, black helicopters on time, oh, they're, they're, they're coming, they're coming, they're gonna, they're gonna take us to an underground bunker somewhere and tie power batteries to our nuts, there is no one coming up! Here. Oh God. Oh God. 
Oh god, I told you. I told you! I told you you were gonna get us killed and now you did it! Now you did it! Okay? Now I'm- Oh, you- Shut up. Wait. Shut up. Oh, look at the birds. Oh, there's a conch shell. Oh. So it's- I could probably come in here, I can hear the ocean. Oh. Open up! You're under arrest. Under arrest for what? Yeah, yeah, be, be firm with the CIA, I think it will be real good. For wasting your life with these conspiracy theories instead of contributing something useful to society. Who the hell are you? Sense in the YouTube. <laughs> you think this is funny? You think this is fun? Oh, I swear to God, I'm gonna kill you and anybody who looks like you. I and, and you, you. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm the the CIA. You're <laughs> like this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Do you, do you see? Do you see? This is what you do. See? This is what you do. Hmm? Are you proud of yourself? Are you proud of yourself? Well, what's the matter? Now you can't take a joke? I was on the phone. Okay? First, he bothered me, now you're interrupting. It's a good thing I did, too. I mean, keep you from running your mouth over the phone about things you can't prove and have no business even speculating about. What are you talking about? I'm talking about what you've been doing this whole time. He is a traitor. He is not a traitor. Be gone with thee! Hang up that phone. I hate him. But he's right. I'm doing you a favor. This, all of this, it's a waste of time. We have put everything into this wall, okay? You've warped your minds into believing you have the truth. We've cast significant doubt on the official version of 9-11. No amount of skepticism is... So then what do you suggest we do? Don't ask advice of this scoundrel here. He's... he's in with them. Them? Answer my question. You know exactly what we should do. Give up. Get washed up. Shower. Shave. Let's go get laid. Let's do what everyone else has done in this country. Let's move on with our lives. You are a stupid, ridiculous little man! Move on! Knowing what we know? As usual, you've missed my point, psycho. We only know three things about 9-11. Three planes crashed, three buildings collapsed, and damage was done to the Pentagon. Everything else is just wild conjecture, and therefore doesn't matter. That is exactly why further investigation is required. Required by us? Why? Because it is our duty. Your duty, baby. Not mine. Unless we're all in this together, fail. Convince me then. Why should I care what happened on 9-11? Why is it my duty to know what really happened? September 11th was the most absurd day of all time. I've often thought that. The masses were inundated with hordes of information, all of it pointing to this shadowy terrorist network and its maniacal supervillain Osama bin Laden. Within hours, it seemed as if the government had solved the crime without even gathering any evidence. It did seem a bit forced, I'll grant you. 
Oh, preach on, brother phone man. Yeah, yeah. There's so many questions. So few answers. And what caused those buildings to collapse? The official version says the fires from the burning jet fuel caused the collapses of the Twin Towers. But can anybody... Not you. But can anybody prove that? Engineers and scientists have proven it with physics. And other engineers and scientists have proven with physics that that didn't happen. What do you mean? Engineers from MIT, from NJIT, from the American Society of Civil Engineers, all say the buildings collapsed from the fire. Other engineers and scientists all say the fires could not have caused the collapses. But this is physics. It's math. It's not up for debate. It is if, if, if you don't have all the information. No one knows how hot the fires burned, how wide or fast the fires spread, how long the jet fuel burned, or even what they so don't need to know. They have the designs of the buildings which, of course, have never been released to the public. And they can make a very well-educated guess. And that's not proof! So why is the official story being shopped around as the official truth? Because no one can prove it's wrong. So it's a universal negative? It's hardly a reason to go to war. Okay. Give me another way those buildings could have come down. Could have been a controlled demolition. It certainly looked like controlled demolitions. And if you look at some angles of replays of the Twin Towers falling, you can actually see squibs where explosive charges are going off. Those could just be latent explosions from the interior buckling of the buildings. The point is, it can't be proven with physics. You know, one person can argue and prove mathematically that one thing happened, while another person can argue and prove the exact opposite. Without the basic tools needed for understanding what was happening inside each building, it is impossible to prove anything. And with absolutely no proof, this government's reaction to 9-11 has essentially been one huge, gigantic hate crime against Muslims. That's because it was first a hate crime against us. Go back to Skull and Bones, you, you neocon, Republican, Nazi, fascist, Zionist, Satanist piece of shit. Shut up, both of you, okay? Focus. There's one anomaly I've yet to mention here. Which is? Never in the history of construction has a single skyscraper ever collapsed due to fire. Never? Not once. So 9-11 was an historic day for controlled demolitions experts. Now you don't even need the explosives. You can just crash a plane right into the building and let the collapse take care of itself. You're right. It's a bit convenient that three buildings fell from fire on the same day when it had never happened before in history. Which brings me to Building 7. For reasons that have never adequately been explained, World Trade Center Building Number 7 collapsed at 5 p.m. that afternoon. Something's always bothered me about that. It was the strangest thing and no one ever talks about it. Building 7 was not hit by a plane. But there were fires raging on floors 8, 11, 12, 13, and 18. Those floors in order were the American Express Bank, the Securities and Exchange Commission, Standard Chartered Bank, and Citigroup. 
Those are four financial institutions. Is that a coincidence? There's no such thing as a coincidence. So what? What? So, so all the floors on fire had to do with money. Big deal. No, no, that, 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 that building also had, had the offices of, of, of the Secret Service and the IRS and, and the clandestine home to the New York branch of the CIA. I mean, imagine. I mean, imagine what kind of, you know, incriminating evidence went down in those buildings. Incriminating? How? That branch of the CIA was the headquarters for the joint FBI-CIA investigation into Al-Qaeda. Standard Chartered Bank was used by Omar Sheikh Saeed to wire $100,000 to hijacker Mohammed Atta. Those offices of the SEC were ground zero for preemptive investigation into pre-9-11 insider trading. Oh, and uh, you, you think they didn't uh, recover all that information? According to officials from the SEC, most of those cases were either scrapped or postponed for a great length of time. Okay. So what about the investigation into Al-Qaeda? That was being headed by FBI agent John O'Neill. Which brings us back to your original question. Who killed John O'Neill and why? I can't answer that yet. States government is the people of the United States. There are several reasons 9-11 was allowed to happen. Allowed to happen by who? By our government. Why would the United States government allow the 9-11 attacks to occur? It is the oldest trick in the book. You hit your own headquarters. Blame it on someone else, and then start a war with the people you framed. Problem, reaction, solution! Problem. Radical Islamic groups have attacked the United States and claim they want to destroy all Western civilization. Reaction! War must be waged against those you have framed, and security must be expanded at home. Solution? No more terrorist attacks. Very informative. I, I can play along too. I can. I, I, wait, I've got one. I've got one. Wait. Problem. You're both pissing me off. Reaction. Hmm? I hate you. Solution. Go fuck yourselves. This wasn't the first time it happened. Give me an example. February 27, 1933. Just 28 days following Hitler's appointment as Chancellor, the German Parliament building, the Reichstag, mysteriously burns to the ground. A Dutch communist named Marinus van der Lubbe is found at the scene, convicted, and then executed. Because of this, the Nazi party, trumpeting for a war with the Soviets, gained significant power in the next national election. And at the same time, Hitler scales back civil liberties at home in response to a national emergency. And as of March 24th, 1933, through the law for terminating the suffering of people and nation, Hitler has consolidated total power in Germany. 
It took just one month for the Nazis to gain total control over Germany. And it sounds frighteningly similar to what happened here on 9-11, 68 years later. Except that you can't prove Hitler burned the Reichstag building any more than you can prove the U.S. government planned 9-11. Even if Al-Qaeda did this, our government is still guilty. What are you talking about? Have you been listening? Do you remember when we made this? Then you should remember that Al-Qaeda was supported and funded by the ISI, and the ISI was supported and funded by the CIA. Everything we need to know is on this wall, gentlemen. Don't tell me you forgot what got us into this in the first place. That's it. If we are going to do anything, we all have to be clear on every single detail on this wall. Okay? Okay? Okay. 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 Let's begin. Now, for all intents and purposes, terrorism in this country officially began with the Pan Am 103 crash in 1988. Now, all during this time, there have been minor terrorist acts. Small bombings, kidnappings, but not the big stuff, okay? So today, we're only going to discuss when the mother load arrived on our soil. On February 26, 1993, a bomb went off in the World Trade Center. Six people were killed and thousands were injured. The idea was to knock the North Tower into the South Tower so both would fall onto Wall Street. But that date is important. Do you know what that date signifies? It's the second anniversary of the end of the Gulf War. And who was blamed for that attack? Muslim extremists. Ramzi Youssef, Muslim extremist. Former Mujahideen fighter Ramzi Youssef entered the country on an Iraqi passport. Now he was sentenced to death by Manhattan Federal Court on September 11th, 1996. Are we beginning to see a pattern here? These Arabs sure have an affinity for anniversaries. Someone sure does. Now, what is their obsession with the World Trade Center? Well, you remember that we were all told that the World Trade Center was a target for terrorism because of one reason. It was the home base of the U.S. economy. But then we're told at the same time that the terrorists targeted us because of our values, because of our freedoms. So why bomb the World Trade Center when structures like the Statue of Liberty or the Washington Monument are far brighter beacons of freedom? Why indeed? I warned that the first World Trade Center attack was a staged event, a psyop, its sole purpose being to shine a light on the World Trade Center towers to convince people that they were future targets of terrorism. I do recall all of the counterterrorism pundits after 9-11 saying, quote, Al-Qaeda always wanted to finish the job. Oh, I'll get to the counterterrorists in a little bit, but your point is well taken. But wait, wait, how do we know that the 93 bombing wasn't Al-Qaeda, hmm? Like everything, we don't exactly know, but in hindsight, it makes the most sense. And here's why. After 93, a series of terrorist attacks plagued the U.S. As we move through this, you will begin to understand how specific agendas within specific parts of government, media, and industry have created a propaganda campaign to wage war. With 9-11 as the prime selling point. There was the OKC bombing in 95, the embassy bombings in Africa in 1998, the USS Cole in 2000 in Yemen, and then, of course, there was 9-11. There's an anomaly in there. All the attacks you just mentioned were blamed on Al-Qaeda, except for OKC. However, there is a connection. Timothy McVeigh's lawyer claims that he and Terry Nichols were not the only two people who planned the OKC bombing. He contends that Nichols made several trips to the Philippines in the years before the bombings and met with Ramzi Youssef. McVeigh served in the Gulf War, and Youssef entered the country with an Iraqi passport. Coincidence? CONSPIRACY! McVeigh and Nichols both visited Al-Qaeda training camps in the Philippines after the Gulf War. Now McVeigh's trial, significant evidence came out that either Al-Qaeda, Iraqi intelligence, or both assisted in the OKC bombings. And more importantly, hundreds of thousands of documents were withheld by the FBI from McVeigh's attorneys. 
The director of the FBI at that time was Louis Free. Now, no one knows what these documents contain, but they very well could have had evidence that McVeigh, Nichols, and other conspirators planned the OKC bombing. See, that doesn't make any sense. Why wouldn't the government want to blame Al-Qaeda for OKC? Because it wasn't 9-11. Neither was the first World Trade Center bombing. You, you have to realize that, that the planning for 9-11 was, was years in advance, maybe even decades. All the terrorist activity leading up to it, they're, they're just little side notes, little warnings of what was to come. So OKC is part of a larger plan. Exactly. All part of the same PSYOP. What's a PSYOP? A PSYOP is a clandestine intelligence operation. Okay, they, they, they are used to, to shift people's perceptions to, to, to a predefined agenda. PSYOPs are used in conjunction with more overt actions called military ops. So PSYOPs are conducted by taking an already established belief and then creating something false around that to take advantage of it. So you can see how easily a PSYOP could have been created surrounding 9-11. You begin by teaching Muslims a new version of Islam, full of violence and extremist beliefs. This sets up one part of the side, the patsies. Then, over the years, you slowly mold the patsies into a fully functioning military operation. Guns, bombs, tanks, the works. Now, the patsies hate you, but they have no idea that you are the one supporting them, because you use an intermediary, someone they believe is on their side. And at the same time, well, you have your thumb on the patsies, right? You filter out information to the public that the patsies are the ones planning the attacks. So when the attacks happen, it is so easy to convince the public the patsies are at fault. But on the flip side, the patsies are doing nothing but talking tough and just committing small and less devastating attacks, while you yourself conduct the military op and carry out the more destructive major strikes. So with carefully executed planning and initiatives in place to keep it all secret, you have all the makings for a military intelligence PSYOP on 9-11. And OKC fits in how? Al-Qaeda is not the only enemy in this war on terror. Ever since this country's inception, a much larger, deeper, darker threat has existed against the powers that be. Dissent. Oklahoma City, it, it shone a light on, on militia groups and cults that were bent on dismantling the U.S. government, typically through military action. You know, it convinced the public that anyone who wanted to take down the U.S. government was as crazy as Timothy McVeigh. Or Kaczynski. The media rarely offers a favorable view of dissent. Only the people who want to destroy the world are ever covered. So just like the WTO convention, the protests in Seattle in 99, OKC discredited any movement questioning the federal government. Anyone questioning the real motives behind 9-11 would automatically be grouped in with people like McVeigh and Nichols, just by association and without even saying a word. So OKC was blamed on domestic terrorists as a means of stomping down dissent in this country? All in preparation for 9-11. So who was running the PSYOP? Have you ever heard of a company called Kroll Associates? The name sounds familiar. Oh, I guarantee you have seen Kroll on television. They are champions of counterterrorism. This is where the counterterrorists come in? Maybe they didn't run the PSYOP, but they sure as hell did cover it up. My friend, Kroll is bigger than you could possibly imagine. Kroll Associates is a global securities and intelligence firm. Publicly traded and privately managed, Kroll specializes in large building security and industrial espionage. In 1993, Kroll got a contract to manage security at the World Trade Center. They held that position up until the moment the towers fell. The current CEO of Kroll is Michael Tricaski. Tricaski is a former assistant district attorney under Robert Morgenthau in Manhattan. The former employees of Kroll include people like William Bratton, a former police commissioner in Boston and New York City, and now chief of the LAPD. And then, of course, there's Brian Jenkins. Based out of Los Angeles, Jenkins is the country's foremost expert on aviation terrorism. 
Now working for the powerful think tank, the Rand Corporation, out of Los Angeles, Jenkins is a noted counterterrorism pundit and appears on many talk shows and news magazines. And lest we forget, Jerome Howard. Jerome Howard, the go-to guy for bioterrorism. In an investigation of 9-11, Howard's name comes up more than anybody else's. As a managing director of Kroll in New York City, Howard was responsible for doing security at the World Trade Center. Jerome Howard, Jerome Howard is also the guy that got John O'Neill his job as head security at the World Trade Center. Yes, he did. Just prior to this, Jerome Howard was Rudy Giuliani's right-hand man in New York, where he headed up the Office of Emergency Management, OEM, FEMA, in New York City. And it was by Jerome Howard's suggestion that Mayor Giuliani constructed what became known as the Federal Bunker Offices in World Trade Center Building No. 7. Fireproof, bombproof, bulletproof, these OEM offices were basically Giuliani's headquarters in New York City. Until WTC 7 collapsed on 9-11. That is incredible. Besides just these jobs, Howard has been the number one bioterrorism expert in the whole world. He is a well-known advisor to the Council on Foreign Relations, formerly worked for the National Institute of Health, and is currently the head of the Office of Public Health Preparedness. And on the morning of 9-11, just as the attacks were happening, Howard instructed the entire White House staff to go on Cipro, the anti-anthrax drug. Now, how did he know anthrax was going to become an issue? Well, as fate would have it, Howard worked in 1999 with Stephen Hatfield, the prime suspect in the anthrax attacks at the Scientific Applications International Corporation, the SAIC. This company, the SAIC, was awarded a huge biodefense contract after 9-11. Hatfield, a well-known friend of Jerome Howard, was working on the military-grade anthrax program at U.S. Amrid, Fort Detrick, Maryland. And Battelle. Don't forget Battelle. A chemicals company with long-standing ties to the CIA. Howard was well aware of the U.S. Amrit project in Maryland. So is Howard CIA? Call the CIA! Come on! We don't know that. Well, yes we do. Yes we do. I mean, their intelligence is not just going to come right out and say it. But you know what they do. You know what they do. Oh, you know it. They are private intelligence! A managing director there has said, quote, Kroll is like a private CIA. He knows what's going on. He knows what's going on. And there are other companies like Kroll as well. There's Tina Protection, run by Robert Tucker. And Tucker? Tucker met with O'Neill and Howard the night before 9-11. They had links at Lanes. There's Strang Hayes Consulting. There's Wackenhut Corporation. Then there's CTC International, the Cohen Group, and then there's Stratisic, formerly called Securicom. Stratisic also had a contract to do security at the World Trade Center. Securicom also had security contracts with Dulles International Airport and United Airlines. And remember, United had two planes crash on 9-11. And one of those planes came from Dulles. Now, an interesting note about Securicom is that from 1993 to 2000, one of its principal shareholders was a man by the name of... Marvin, Marvin Bush. Bush! Marvin Bush. Marvin Bush. Marvin Bush. The president's younger brother. That's an interesting connection. But not necessarily indicative of anything. It's six degrees of separation. Bushy's younger brother doing security in the World Trade Center is something that needs to be seriously investigated! By that rationale, we could have known a guy who knew a guy who worked with a guy who stood in the same street corner as Jerome Howard, and therefore we're guilty. We are saying it's guilt by association. Which maybe we shouldn't do. You can't discount Kroll's connection to all of this! No, I can't. And I won't. Now, Kroll has been involved in a host of shady operations. In 1991, the Kuwaiti government hired Kroll to investigate Saddam Hussein's finances. In 2002, Kroll was given the massive responsibility of reorganizing Enron. 
through 97 and 98, Kroll oversaw the elections of the Teamsters Union. And just following 9-11, Kroll was tapped by the LAPD to monitor all counterterrorism efforts in Los Angeles. Kroll really gets around. Trade Center bombing was a man by the name of William Sessions. Now, when he left the Bureau, he became a shareholder of Kroll. And the next FBI director was Louis Free. And Louis Free's top advisor at the Bureau was a guy named James Buckdom. Guess where he works now? He's a managing director of Kroll. Free is now a senior vice president at the MBNA Credit Card Corporation. His specific duties include personnel and security. Next to Enron, MBNA was the largest campaign contributor to George W. Bush in 2000. One of Free's deputy directors was James K. Kallstrom. With a K. At the time of 9-11, Kallstrom was head of New York State's Office of Public Security. And he also works at MBNA with Louis Free. Both Free and Kallstrom are well-known friends of Jerome Howard. Now, it has been rumored that MBNA was one of the companies heavily involved in pre-9-11 insider trading, which would have been investigated by the SEC in New York City, but all those records went down in World Trade Center 7. You want to know what really gets me? I'll tell you what really gets me. How all these, all these guys, how, how did Tchaikovsky and Jenkins and Bratton and Howard, just how the hell did they become terrorism pundits, huh? huh? I mean, they, they, they drop themselves out on TV all the goddamn time and say, Al-Qaeda this, and terrorist threat that, and from our research, and blah, blah, blah. Just where the hell did they get all their information? I hate to say it, but he's right. The unofficial law enforcement or intelligence, yet somehow they became the foremost experts on counterterrorism. A lot of them are former law enforcement. But terrorism is one of the most closely guarded fields of all intelligence. Why would you leak information just to a couple of buddies and allow them to trump all that information on a national television hmm? to build up the propaganda campaign, obviously? To frame up Al Qaeda before and after the fact? Look. We've all got to understand that, that a company like Kroll, even though it won't disclose its intelligence ties, is, is intimately linked to the CIA. But if we're saying that the CIA runs domestic terrorism operations, we are saying Kroll does as well. These people have so much information about terrorism because they're either deeply rooted to intelligence, or they are intelligence privatized in order to make their work legal and untouchable by Congress. Oh God, oh God, are we, are we saying that, that, that the people who run counterterrorism may very well be the terrorists themselves? Look, it's no coincidence that Kroll did security at those buildings. And it's no secret that Kroll employees have more inside knowledge about terrorism than even the FBI and the CIA do. They are inexplicably in a position to get inside information, even from people like John O'Neill. Then they come out and they warn the country, or they tell everybody what the, how, how the whole terrorist outfit works. They are well-placed operatives working a specific agenda to frame the patsies. And what do they say? To frame someone, you have to know the real details of the crime? Kroll is our suspect number one. No one had more means, motive, or opportunity to commit this attack. You can't be serious. What you're saying is suicide. You do not go out and publicly accuse a company like Kroll Associates of being a publicly traded terrorism company, okay? These people profit from insider knowledge of coming terrorist attacks. 
They don't disclose their credentials or their contacts. They merely claim they are experts from Kroll, and that's supposed to mean they are trustworthy. We need to stick to what we can prove here. All of this is just blatant speculation and can discredit this entire thing. Unless it's true. This is not how you run an investigation. You do not just dream up a hypothesis and then change the evidence to make it come true. You follow your leads. Which led to crawl! But not to this wild theory. I'm sure that these counter-terrorists are involved somehow. But there is no proof whatsoever that they took part in any of the attacks or even had any foreknowledge. So does that mean we just forget about it? Move on to the next topic? No. It means we don't get sidetracked. We can't just go flapping our lips about any old theory that we want to. So then how does Cole get their information? How do these guys, of all people, know information that, that, that even our paid law enforcement and intelligence officials don't know? I mean, how does one become a terrorism expert anyway? You already have your answer. Former FBI directors on their board, former biowarfare experts within their infrastructure, members of major think tanks as directors, former U.S. attorneys as executives. This company is filled with people who could have had prior knowledge and just kept their contacts secret. This is a security company, after all. And one of the most important security issues facing the world in the last 20 years has been security from terrorism. That's where they get all their information. That is how they become counter-terrorism experts. He has a point. There is clearly something wrong with Kroll, but we can't jump to conclusions. So then where do you think Kroll fits into this whole thing? They're just a group of for-hire thugs. They come in and trump up the charges on whoever needs to be guilty, and then they fade back into the shadows. The only thing I see them being guilty of is misleading the public. And the purpose of that? Maybe you're right. Maybe it is to cover up their crime. Or maybe, and so that people will hire them to secure their buildings. Maybe they take advantage of 9-11 the same way that Bush does. They take advantage of 9-11 for profit. Come on! Cherkasky is their CEO! It's obvious he's dirty! Obvious to us, yes. Look, Cherkasky takes us back to New York. Let's focus on that. U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of Manhattan. Not that much, although I'm sure they've been involved with the most high-profile cases in this country's history. Right, and it's time we went through that history. Louis Free spent his entire career in law enforcement in New York City before becoming FBI Director. And from 1981 to 1991, Free worked as a U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York City. And Rudy Giuliani worked in that same office from 1983 to 1993, just before he became mayor. And do not forget, don't you dare forget, that Cherkasky, the, 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 the current CEO of Kroll, okay, the Kroll guy, he was in New York too at the same time. He was doing all the prosecutions too. You know it. Make sure you tell him that. But Noriega, Gotti, and the BCCI have one very special thing in common. What's that? They were all key players in the global drug trade. I figured drugs would make their way into this story. Make their way? My friend, drugs are at its core.
What do you know about the global drug trade? Only what I read in the papers. Then you know nothing. This is covered with even less honesty in the mainstream press than 9-11 is. I've always assumed intelligence was involved. As usual, your assumption would be correct. The war between the Soviets and the Afghans ended in 1979. Meanwhile, the drug trade from Latin America was heating up with significant assistance from the CIA. It started big time with the formation of the Median Drug Cartel in Colombia in 1978. Founded by Carlos Leder, the Cho brothers, and Pablo Escobar, the Median Cartel operated by manufacturing the coca plant into cocaine and shipping it to the U.S. The collaboration began when Leader purchased an island in the Bahamas, where corporate tax and banking laws are extremely lenient, and used that land as a jumping off point to launder the money taken in by the drug sales. The Bahamas is home to thousands of tax exempt corporations, including companies owned and managed by American International Group, AIG, the largest insurance company in the world and the sixth largest corporation in the world. One of AIG's companies in the Bahamas is named after a woman called Coral Talavera. And who is she? She's Carlos Leader's wife. She is the head of an AIG branch in San Francisco. I don't understand. Isn't Carlos Leader in prison? Not anymore. Carlos Leader was extradited from Colombia to the United States for trial in 1987. A year later, he was convicted and sentenced to life plus 135 years for drug trafficking and murder. While he was in prison, Carlos Leader struck a deal with the United States. Take down the cartel, and he would be granted freedom. Along the way, he implicated and then testified against Manuel Noriega, Panamanian dictator and middleman for the Medellin cartel. Noriega was captured through an invasion of Panama in 1989 under the first President Bush. He was convicted of drug running, racketeering, and money laundering in 1992. And leader? According to the official U.S. record, whereabouts unknown. See, there's one thing that ties all these points together. The cartel, AIG, the CIA, the Contras, Noriega. One thing connects them all. The BCCI. The Bank of Credit and Commerce International, or for our discussion today, the granddaddy of all money laundering scams. The BCCI was and remains the largest instance of fraud and bankruptcy in global history. Located out of Abu Dhabi, the BCCI operated without fail throughout the 70s and 80s as a money laundering and investment finance bank. This is documented in the investigation by Morgenthau and Cherkasky in New York, but also by the investigation in the United States Senate, which was headed by Senator John Kerry. Financial ties can be made between the BCCI and Manuel Noriega through his facilitation of the drug trade. By 1992, the BCCI was broke and busted up by U.S. authorities. However, one point about this rarely mentioned case is that a principal shareholder of the BCCI, right, is the guy named Khalid Bin Mahfouz. Khalid Bin Mahfouz. A Saudi financier and investment banker whose other claim to fame is his dubious investment in a company called Harkin in the late 80s. Harkin? Isn't that one of George W. Bush's companies? The man with a 20% stake in the largest money laundering operation the world has ever seen saved our president's business career. Khalid bin Mahfouz has also been implicated as one of many very prominent Saudis who has funneled money to Osama bin Laden. That would make President Bush someone who has done business with a known terrorist! But bin Mahfouz. Regardless, the drug trade is going to escalate in the 1980s. And why wouldn't it? Reagan is your president, and Bush is your VP. Okay, the, 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 the greatest drug smuggler in the history of drug smuggling was a guy named Barry Seal. Barry Seal, okay? He was an admitted CIA agent, okay? He was contracted at least as back as like the early 60s. In the early 60s, Barry Seal is living in New Orleans, where he joins a Civil Air Patrol unit, whose captain is an eccentric fellow by the name of David Ferry. Joe Pesci from JFK? Ferry was, by all indications, a conspirator in the JFK assassination. And another member of the Civil Air Patrol unit is... Lee Harvey Oswald. So the drug trade is somehow tied to the JFK assassination? Seemingly. But the connections don't stop there. 
And the Barry Seal was a pilot, a great pilot by all accounts. Now everyone assumes that David Ferry was a getaway pilot for the assassins in Dallas, so it's possible to presume that Barry Seal was one as well. In late 1963, Seal is seen in a picture with Frank Sturgis and Felix Rodriguez. Sturgis was indicted and convicted as one of the five Watergate burglars. He testified in court that his handler on that assignment was E. Howard Hunt. Hunt would remember working in the Nixon White House. Now the Rockefeller Commission investigating illegal acts by the CIA in the 70s regarded both Hunt and Frank Sturgis as possible conspirators in the JFK assassination. What is Barry Seal doing in a photograph of a possible JFK assassin? But it's... It's the other man in the SEAL photograph who has a more ominous distinction. Felix Rodriguez was a Cuban refugee. In the late 50s, he began working with the CIA to recruit war refugees for an invasion of Cuba. This was done under the direction of the CIA agent Ted Shackley. Incidentally, Ted Shackley also worked the Far East drug trade with Richard Secord in the early 50s. Felix Rodriguez also figures into the assassination of Bolivian President Che Guevara in 1967. So where is Barry Seal in all of this? He's in New Orleans until at least 1968, when he takes over for the late David Ferry as captain of the Civil Air Patrol. Now in the early 70s, Barry Seal is running cocaine through New Orleans. He's running it on planes later identified to be former Air America planes. The planes used by the CIA in the 50s and 60s to ship heroin from the Far East. When the Medellin cartel is founded, Seal immediately hooks up with their operation. By 1981, he is trafficking in more drugs than anyone in the history of this country. And it is around this time that Barry Seal moves his operation from New Orleans to Mena, Arkansas. And where is that? About 180 miles from Little Rock. A small little out of the way mountain town. A small little out of the way mountain town that just so happens to have a major U.S. airport. The Mina Intermountain Municipal Airport. From at least 1981 to 1986, this airport is ground zero for all illegal narcotics activity in the United States. You see Barry Seal? He began flying his drugs into this airport, most likely with the knowledge of then President Reagan and the next two presidents, Bush and Clinton. How does he get away with it? He only gets away with it for a little while. It is suspected that SEAL traffics in nearly $5 billion worth of cocaine in this five-year period. The U.S. Attorney in Arkansas at this time, Asa Hutchinson, now opens an investigation, even though FBI informants, media employees, and the Arkansas State Police have all told him that this illegal drug trafficking has been occurring. Ironically, Hutchinson went on to head the DEA and is now the Undersecretary for Border Transportation and Security in the Department of Homeland Security. So SEAL is virtually untouchable for this period. Even though the FBI and the DEA have all opened up investigations into his operation, he remains a contract agent with the CIA. But with overwhelming evidence of drug trafficking mounting against him, he finally turned states in 1985. He testifies in several trials against Medellin traffickers. And this compromises the entire CIA operation. I mean, Barry Seal isn't only running drugs for the cartel, he's also involved in the drugs for arms trade in Nicaragua. The DEA even places him in a sting to photograph Contras loading cocaine onto an airplane in Nicaragua. And this pisses the CIA off, but good! SEAL's next mission is to trick Pablo Escobar and the Ochoa brothers into coming to a, a neutral third-party country where they will be extradited. I mean, he's about to take down the entire Medellin cartel. But then news of SEAL's cooperation with the DEA became leaked to the national media. He has to be called back in midair from his task to meet with the Ochoa brothers and Pablo Escobar. And who is responsible for this press leak? Admittedly, it is none other than Oliver North, the primary figurehead in the Iran-Contra scandal. Barry Seal is later gunned down in Baton Rouge, assassinated by the Medellin cartel. It is rumored that on his dead body is the personal private phone number of George H.W. Bush. The MENA operation is already in jeopardy, but it becomes a major problem when one of Seal's former planes is shot down by Sandinistas later on in 1986. The only survivor of the crash is a man named Eugene Hasenfuss, and he claims he is running cocaine for the CIA. The plane can be tracked back to MENA. So for the time being, the MENA operation is close to being exposed. No president has ever spoken directly about the events in MENA, Arkansas. However, 
Governor Clinton, just when he was rising from obscurity to become president, made his only public comments about the massive drug operation being conducted right in his own backyard. In 1991, Clinton referred to the Arkansas State Police investigation of MENA and the drug trafficking thereof as having linkages to the federal government and includes all kinds of questions whether he, meaning SEAL, had any links to the CIA. And it got backed into the Iran Contra deal. The war on drugs? It's just a war against the inner cities. The wealthy line their pockets with all the illegal drug money, drugs that they bring into the country themselves, and they peddle it off to the poor people in the ghettos. In the 1980s, the number of Americans in prisons doubled from 500,000 to 1 million. Most of these convicts are drug offenders. And from 85 to 88 alone, prosecutions for white drug offenders dropped 15%, while it rose 88% for blacks. Even though it is estimated at this time that 80% of all drug users are white. Now ironically, one of the security companies linked to the CIA, Wagonhut Corporation, owns and maintains its own private prisons here in the US. It is another form of government-sponsored terrorism. Poverty, violence, death, these all stem from drug abuse. Think about prohibition. The government lifted the ban on alcohol because the social ills of alcohol abuse weren't nearly as bad as, as the violence that came along with the criminal importation of alcohol. So why not legalize all drugs? Surely there would be more drug addiction, more drug-related death, but there would be far less violence associated with the illegal sale of narcotics. Which is the lesser of two evils? The CIA has destroyed the inner cities of this country, destroyed millions of lives at a profit. I'll give you one guess as to the primary bank used for laundering the money from the global drug trade. The BCCI. And then there's AIG. AIG means its own fleet of aircraft. AIG owns and maintains over 400 airplanes. Any number of these planes could be used for the transfer of narcotics. And in 1987, the Arkansas Development Financial Agency collaborated with AIG to found Coral Reinsurance. Named after Carlos Leder's wife, the same year Leder was extradited. The formation of this company has never been filed with the SEC. There's no known paperwork on it at all. And Arkansas was where SEAL was flying in his drugs. Yes as a CIA operation. With Bill Clinton as governor of Arkansas, during the heyday of the BCCI, with Noriega still in power in Panama, and with John Gotti heading the New York Mafia, where more drugs end up than anywhere in the world. This truly is a vast conspiracy. You could say that. And AIG's founder is a well-known CIA operative, C.V. Starr. And one of AIG's current directors is the son of CIA founder, Frank Wister. Now the chairman and CEO of AIG is a man named Maurice Hank Greenberg. Now he's formerly the head of the New York Stock Exchange and the Federal Reserve. Not only that, in 1995 his name was floated by all people, Jay Rockefeller, to be head of the CIA. Instead, Bill Clinton appointed John Deutsch, who had been a director of the SAIC, the technology and biodefense company formerly advised by Jerome Howard and Stephen Hatfield. But, but don't lose sight of Greenberg! Maurice Greenberg has also chaired the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR. What's that? One of the most powerful organizations in the world. Founded in 1921 by President Wilson's chief counsel, Colonel Edward House, the CFR operates as the primary advisor to the United States government. The CFR's principal contact in the U.S. is the CIA. And the chairman of the CFR is the CEO of AIG. With its obvious intelligence links, just imagine how scary it is to think about a company like AIG. Insurance companies are the foremost private intelligence gathering agencies in the world. Insurance agents? They can find out anything about anybody! Who knows more about you than your insurance company? Your medical records? Your bank records? Driving records? Personal history? Your fucking life story? Just think if that company was sharing information with the government. Worse, just think if that company had $100 billion in assets and could invest that money at will.
You're saying that money laundered from the drug trade could be used to fund terrorism. There's one fact I haven't told you yet. What's that? In 1993, AIG became the principal shareholder of Kroll Associates. CIA in the 70s, and with the near disastrous Iran Contra and MENA exposures, the intelligence community it had to realize that its facilitation of the drug trade, if revealed to the public, could prove fatal to any and all future endeavors. So, so if you're the CIA, you might get a little smarter about it. With MENA, the CIA had no cover story, no backup plan. Instead, the entire operation was nearly outed and the whole global drug trade almost became public knowledge. You have to move the MENA operation. Well, where do you move it to? Some place even more out of the way than MENA. And what's more out of the way than a flight school? Wow. Where did Mohammed Atta get his flight training? Hoffman Aviation School in Venice, Florida. There are over 200 flight schools in Florida. Why did the hijackers just happen to choose Huffman? Huffman Aviation is authorized by the INS to issue these very popular vocational student visas to foreigners. These allow people to enter the country legally and without much paperwork. Mohammed Atta had one of these visas. Guess who gave it to him? It's Rudy Deckers, CEO of Huffman Aviation. And there is overwhelming evidence that Rudy Deckers works for the CIA. Why would a CIA agent run a flight school? On July 5th, 2000, the DEA discovered over 30 pounds of heroin on a plane owned by Wally Hilliard. And who is he? He is the owner of Huffman Aviation. The same Huffman Aviation which in the 1990s induced hundreds of Arab students to come and train at their school by issuing these highly coveted visas. Is it starting to make sense now? 30 pounds of cocaine, Arab men posing as students, CIA agent to CEO. Okay, I see where you're going with all this. The MENA operation didn't stop. It just changed locations to this flight school and probably dozens of others. And Mohammed Atta's role in all of this? He is not training to be a pilot. He is a pilot. He is the new Barry Seal. There is evidence Mohammed Atta had flight training at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. And if he already has flight training, why is he attending a flight training school? Who says Al-Qaeda is a terrorist operation? Al-Qaeda was formed in the wake of the fall of the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. The phrase translates literally to mean the base. They're essentially an arm of the former Mujahideen, which was created by the CIA. The CIA runs drugs globally. The CIA trains its own armies 
and pilots and instills a military presence in every country all around their crop. The Sandinistas, the Colombian death squads, and now Al-Qaeda. If you're pushing 70% of the world's heroin out of one country, and something goes wrong and the operation becomes public, you need a backup plan. Al-Qaeda isn't involved in terrorism. They're just framed up as terrorists to hide their true nature. They are a drug cartel, plain and simple. All that video they show of Osama firing his machine gun and, and trading on those people, he's not trading terrorists. He's training soldiers. Soldiers to go on the heroin trade. When 9-11 happens and Al-Qaeda is pinned for the crime, no one cares at all about the heroin smuggling. Because drug smuggling means nothing to people who have just watched the World Trade Center explode. All right, but you're still missing a major point here, okay? How could Al-Qaeda smuggle all this heroin out of Afghanistan when the Taliban abolished all poppy farming in 1999? The, the Taliban did this? Says who? You're saying they didn't? I know the U.S. claims they did, but if the Taliban did this, tell me. How did they make $40 million off of taxes from opium farmers in 2000? So what are you saying? I'm saying the Taliban only eradicated their crop on paper. In reality, the heroin trade continued. There were fucking aerial photographs and surveillance, satellite imagery. The goddamn fields were being burned. Of course they were. Part of the process of growing any kind of crop is eradicating the fields to then regrow the plants. And it makes no sense for the Taliban to stop the flow of opium. It's the only thing keeping the economy afloat at all. And the Taliban, the Taliban, it's, it's installed. It's installed in Afghanistan specifically for the purpose of, of keeping the heroin flow coming. Oh yeah, keep it coming, baby. Because if you have a cartel like Al-Qaeda, functioning as a patsy, being blamed for terrorist attacks all over the world. You would need a government not recognized by the United Nations. That way, you couldn't invade and you couldn't extradite any of the terrorists. And the heroin trade goes on without missing a beat. So what you are saying, let me get this straight. What you are saying is that the only reason they do 9-11 is specifically to hide the fact that Al-Qaeda is a drug cartel? Because I gotta tell you, that is the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard in my entire life. 9-11 didn't just hide the opium trade. It gave the United States a free pass to invade Afghanistan and build the oil pipeline they had been planning for years. It set up a race war. It set up a religious war. It opened the door for the United States to attack anybody it deemed was, was, was harboring terrorists. Internationally or domestically. And what did W say? You're either with us or you're with the terrorists. And 9-11 instilled in us the basis of all fears. Any time, any day, any place, an airplane, tall building, subway, shopping mall, grocery store, Local newsstand, chemical, biological, nuclear, doesn't matter. 9-11 could happen again. And guess what? It will happen again. It's inevitable. This is a lifelong battle. In this corner, you have the United States, the shining example of freedom, peace, and goodwill. And in the other corner, you have Al-Qaeda. Dirty, bearded, hate-mongering terrorists. The whole thing's a setup. It's a show. It's theater. It distracts all of us from what's really going on. The systematic destruction of national sovereignty all across the world. That is preposterous. What's easier to believe? When Al-Qaeda is a vicious terrorist organization bent on annihilating all freedom and peace in the world? Or it's a cartel whose sole purpose is to ensure the safety of the heroin trade out of the Middle East. That is a real tough one. I'm going to go with option A. They are Islamic fundamentalists. 
They flew fucking planes into the World Fucking Trade Center, okay? They killed some 3,000 infidels along with themselves because Allah told them it was a smart thing to do. If I were to tell you that a man habitually does cocaine, frequents strip clubs and, and, and escort services, would you believe he were A, a drug runner, or B, an Islamic fundamentalist? That's obvious. What is your fucking point? The man I am referring to is Mohammed Atta. Mohammed Atta did cocaine. Mohammed Atta was seen doing cocaine several times before 9 11. But what's more, Atta isn't seen doing this all by himself. Often, Rudy Deckers is with him, the guy who runs the flight school. Islamic fundamentalism strictly forbids the ingestion of any unnatural drug, and it firmly teaches that treating women as objects of desire is a sin. So if Muhammad Atta is already committing sins, he ain't going to paradise to see Allah, that's for sure. So why would he then take his own life in a terrorist attack? If you can conclude that Mohammed Atta did not fly one of those planes into the World Trade Center, then you must conclude something else happened on 9-11. You're right. And that begs the question, what really happened on 9-11? War and drugs are the biggest businesses in the world. They are tools to amass the greatest fear and exercise the mightiest control. Control over the mind. They wave the flag of war, proposing to wield the ultimate power in places afar. Using 9-11 as a fucking bargaining chip. Support this war, or you're gonna get attacked again. Bow down on constitutional security measures, otherwise the guy sitting next to you, he might blow you up. Allow us to attack our enemies before they attack us, otherwise all freedom is lost. It's a protection racket. All the government is, is the mob. And their greatest crime is profiting from acts of war. And everybody's in on it. Defense contractors manufacture weapons for use during war, while supporting and financing political candidates who will go to war. The government, the government that buys weapons from these companies in the event of war. Now with war crippling to most economies, nations must then borrow money and go into debt. And all that money goes right up to the top of the food chain. To the banks, which is where it came from in the first place. Only now there's a difference. Because the money lent now has an insane amount of interest attached to it. More than most nations can afford to pay off. And then the cycle repeats itself. No one ever wonders where the national debt comes from. Who loans countries the trillions of dollars it takes to fund the national budget? Is it us? Is it the people? If that's true, then the government owes us seven trillion dollars. It's not us. We didn't give them seven trillion dollars. There are only 250 billion Federal Reserve notes in circulation. Where the fuck does all this money come from? From banks, from private multinational institutions that can exert immense power from behind the scenes. The kind of clout gained from having every person, state, province, and nation in debt to you. By controlling all money in the world, you can control all people in the world. And the more war there is, the more money there is. Boeing, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, the SAIC, Carlyle Group, the list goes on. Every single one of these companies makes its living off of the misery of others. And to them, it's just business as usual. These companies even arm our enemies before we fight them. They can even control people with the threat of war. And when a tragedy strikes, 
when the nation is in mourning, when we are in our most vulnerable state, what do they tell us to do? Shop. They tell us to spend money. Trying to make a quick buck off of grieving people. It's not capitalism. It's not consumerism. It's not even corporatism. You know what it is? It is corporate fundamentalism. All these people know how to do is bring everything to market. The banks, the corporations, the government, the elite. They use poverty to marginalize the rest of the world. The upper 1%. When they tell us there are minorities, blacks, Latinos, Asians. The only minority that counts is the upper 1%. The rest of us are just slaves. Slaves to the dollar, slaves to the elite, slaves to their dogma. And dogma is so powerful because as soon as you believe it, you become afraid of its opposite. It's divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. And they do more than just that. They brainwash us in other ways. Just think back to 9-11. Think back to, to how confused and helpless we all were. Over and over and over and over, the TV just kept showing the replays. The towers kept falling. Patients suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder will often face a recurring trauma. In this state, scientists have proven that the human mind is very susceptible to suggestion. These people will believe anything that you tell them. We all incurred major trauma on 9-11. They could have told us that the fucking UFOs piloted those planes into the Twin Towers, and on 9-11, we would have believed them because we just needed it to stop. We just needed to point the finger at someone and say they are responsible, and because we needed to know our government could protect us. It was PTSD on a national scale. All the images, the rhetoric, patriotic American themes, it has all hijacked our minds. Senator Johnson said in 1917, the first casualty when war comes is the truth. And what are we going to do about that? You know, I, I didn't want to say anything before, you know, I, you know how easily they can get riled up, but I, uh, wanted to tell you, you know, I, I think that what you've done here, it's very courageous. You do. Yes. I do. I mean, you've, you challenged something which has already become official history, and you've done all your research, you, you've gotten all your facts straight. I mean, you've done something here which could persuade nearly anyone 9-11 was an inside job. But it's not enough. You, you've got to understand something. I believe everything you've said here. I do. But there's not a damn thing you can do to stop it. You are just one man. You're fighting a machine that has been running almost on autopilot for thousands of years. How do you plan on killing it? People will believe. People want to believe. Doesn't mean they will. We've got to make them believe. But what do you propose to do? And do you plan to revolt? How do you plan on doing that? We must do something. I agree. But what? There are plenty of things we could do. Like what? But what I understand, and you've done a pretty good job of hammering this home, the beast has been alive forever. No one's been able to stop it so far. What makes you think you are the one who will succeed? Honestly, what do you suggest? Vote? Vote Democrat, any Democrat? Don't vote at all? Support a third party protest? Well, how? A petition the government? Write your congressman? Form an assembly outside the Capitol? Rally the troops? Tell your friends? Support a conspiracy theory? Any conspiracy theory, so long as it proves your point? But what then? What do people do? Shout to the heavens? March on Washington? Armed insurrection? To the death? 
Give me liberty or give me death. You're serious, aren't you? You're willing to die for this. Well, guess what? You might just get your wish. What do you mean? Take a look at yourself. You haven't slept or eaten in months. You're weak, disoriented, exhausted. What the fuck did you think was gonna happen? It was only a matter of time. But for what? You still don't get it. You are going to die. And if you don't do something about that right now, all of this will be for naught. We must do something. So, you really want to know what happened on 9-11? I am prepared to listen.
guns, bombs, tanks, just overall general killing. They're going to take us to an underground bunker somewhere and tie power batteries to our nuts. Ooh, I'm the, the CIA. <laughs> Had any links to the CIA? And if that backed into the Iran Contra deal, he has a point. He's training soldiers. Soldiers to guard the heroin trade. 